Hello, this is Alan Wheeler here on my channel where I usually talk about tarot and spirituality, uh, but I'm going to dive into pure spirituality today, a challenging topic. Um, what is all-inclusive mysticism? And part of uh, the reason for this is I feel challenged uh, doing some working with the uh, new moon as the uh, new moon phases begin, uh, looking to find closure um, in a sense and define what is the new me. And I think I've arrived at the term all-inclusive mystic, uh, but at the heart of this is um, the affirmation I am finding and following my bliss. And um, I'm not going to get into that long story right here, but it arose through some tarot readings and a uh, kind of a trance meditative journey, and all of it's very mystical. So uh, it is part of the new me. Now, uh, there's something about, uh, there's a power in having a name, such as um, those who decide I am calling myself a witch for the first time. I am a pagan. Um, and I have thought about what, what do I call myself? Um, in one sense, I feel a great affinity for pagan practitioners, witches. Um, I've even joined an online uh, coven. And so I, in a way, I think of myself as a witch brother. Um, although I'm surely still learning all of uh, those things are very new to me. Um, I could call myself a spiritual practitioner, uh, which is a little clunky, unwieldy. And I've thought about, um, for the longest time, um, I dubbed myself a perennial uh, Christian mystic, um, changing that to um, pantheistic, uh, uh, eclectic, uh, mystic, and it's just tough to explain. So I think I've arrived at the term, by way of introduction, all-inclusive mystic. Um, and I really think it is a thing, um, but what is all-inclusive mysticism? So, first of all, uh, mysticism has been accused of being intentionally vague and meaningless. Uh, part of the reason I like it is that um, it's kind of that SBNR, spiritual but not religious, that's very uh, popular today and allows for irreverence and a lot of uh, freedom. Spiritual but not religious, SBNR. Um, and I suppose uh, in a way it is, but in history uh, it has had real context. It's been, uh, it refers to a deep experience, of course, that seems mysterious. Um, in the West, it's often been thought of as union, um, kind of uh, becoming one with love, becoming one with the divine, um, in that kind of experience. In the East, uh, sometimes it's been uh, nothingness, an experience of the um, oneness maybe, but oneness of soul. And I'll come back to that. So that's the mysticism. Uh, what about all-inclusive? Well, um, as some of my other videos have grappled with, I think there's a spectrum 
on the on the one hand there's the exclusive uh, that exclusivity that tribal urge um, in its dark side its fundamentalism and actually harming those that are not of your tribe uh, discrimination prejudice and um, maybe in the brighter sense um, any community is defined by its borders and we want a sense of identity um, it helps us operate um, and then on the other side of the spectrum everything's the same all is one and so the perennialists um, would say that all these diverse religions have a single source or have a, a single goal and of course universalism would be on that far right side but i think between uh, the two we have inclusivism various um you know more um to the traditional side where uh, people are very accepting of other um, faiths, religions, uh, practices, but still maintaining their own, the, the more relative side, where um, everyone has a piece of the puzzle. And uh, so I was surprised. Um, I'll give an example here to show that, that really plays out these terms in the real world. So I was writing a blog post um, about kind of my eclectic um, putting together of different um, deities and practices and referring to soft polytheism. Um, so some people who uh, see the divine and everything in nature and all things kind of have a soft that um, the energies may emerge as different deities and guides and things. And as I was writing about this, I had a comment from a Greek um, pagan poly polytheist who came on and pretty well attacked me, saying there is no such thing as soft polytheism. Um, so uh, he said that monotheism is essentially atheism because you don't believe in every other god and there is no such thing as soft polytheism um, essentially that's monism that's uh, not the same thing and he was quite um, firm and came across to me <laughs> as almost oh my gosh this is like the fundamentalism in christianity um, so I am not wanting to move from one camp to another camp. I want to expand here um, just for myself. So I would like to see the coexistence of many contacts, whether you want to call them contexts, where these experiences spring up, Ireland, Greece, and so on, or many constructs. Uh, if you're into social constructivism and, and think we make our um, beliefs, uh, we make our um, environment. Um, so I would, whatever way you look at it, I would like to see them coexisting, not like the wheat and the tares. So uh, there, you have your inside group and the other one are the weeds. Everyone else are the weeds. Now, even there, um, those believers are told to let the wheat and the tares grow together, but uh, there's a problem for me in that someday those weeds are going to be pulled out, and that may affect the, the um, behavior of those who follow that belief. So I have a problem with that. Um, the other side of the spectrum, everything is wheat. There is no difference. Um, but I think the all-inclusive way of looking at it is there's wheat, there's corn, there's beans, there's different crops, um, all have their use. We can learn something from each one. Uh, maybe not, any one of them may not be the perfect um, 
all-encompassing meal. So that's the all-inclusive aspect to the mysticism. Um, let me go back to the uh, mysticism part of this identity. So um, we often, in mis thinking of the mystical, the mystic, we often think of that ecstasy, those altered states or alternate consciousness, um, that intuitive insight that comes. And uh, William James um, legitimized it and popularized it in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, and he was more of a perennialist. He, he was more of the kind that said, all these different experiences point to the same psychological uh, reality. And um, so that book was very influential. Um, but that's kind of the an individual just looking at each personal experience with the mysticism. Um, and just, um, it's kind of like this uh, mystical consciousness. It can be fleeting, here today, gone tomorrow, or abiding as monks or um, others practice, put it into practice daily. Um, it can be that spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings that Wordsworth talked about, that he thought that prophetic experience of the poet. Um, but in the more expanded sense of a continuing practice, uh, we can see that mysticism as contemplation, deep thought, um, even, even if it's intuitive, meditation, and transformation over time. And in that longer-term process, um, that really broad definition begins to bring in um, transcendentalism, theosophy, and many of the religious traditions have a mystical branch. So um, Sufism, um, like the famous poet Rumi, and of course Hinduism and the yoga there, um, Buddhist modernism and New Age practices, um, much occult and esotericism, and then in pagan um, communities, we hear talk of the UPG, or the unverified personal gnosis, that knowledge that just comes um, to the individual that can't necessarily be verified. Um, and then there's all the mystery religions and initiatory groups. So it begins to border, on, we're getting away from SBNR, spiritual but not religious, but seeing that sometimes um, it's part of actual um, religious groups. Now, um, some of my dilemma stems from uh, those, uh, uh, some people claim that they are very inclusive and loving. Uh, Christians, for example, would think of themselves as so loving, but then when it comes down to uh, doctrine, it feels harsh. Uh, for me sometimes. This makes me sad. Also, um, sometimes very open um, polytheists who say anything goes, it's all up to the uh, individual practitioner, um, except the Christians, or except the Abrahamic faiths. We're not that. Um, and so all th this kind of exclusion um, is uh, a burr in my mind and a pain. Um, so I see the, the I would prefer all, the all-inclusive mindset to like the, the anti-mainstream mindset. Uh, we're not that. That's uh, because I think that there is value, um, even though we need to throw out that old bathwater and the things that aren't serving and the harmful things, um, 
in the Abrahamic religions, in, in the New Age, in the Eclectic, even maybe um, in the fundamentalists, which I have a, a real problem with. You know, there seems to be limits to my tolerance. And, uh, but maybe there may be something to learn from those traditions that have outgrown the, their practices that just don't work uh, today. So let me close with the types of mysticism and a couple theories. Uh, the types, um, there's, of course, there's many different ways to group things, uh, but one way I've seen is uh, how we started with East and West, and then we'll add a couple to those. But the theistic mysticism um, that involves deity, really, or almost personal uh, deity, uh, would include the Jewish mysticism, the Christian mysticism, uh, some of the Hinduism, um, such as found in the Bhagavad Gita, would be this type. Um, I suppose some of the uh, working with deity in pagan communities might border on this. Then there's the monistic, that's the Eastern. And so this is more the unity of the soul or the, an experience of just nothingness or ego transcendence. And then there may be some overlaps. There's something called uh, panhenic mysticism, uh, which is, as best as I can figure out, a combination of the other two. Uh, sometimes called an all-in-one mysticism or natural mysticism. So being in nature, it's kind of an extroverted type. Um, it might be drug-induced or in nature. And feeling one with the all. Feeling one with the, through na in nature. And, um, and then let me add on to this uh, secular mysticism. So a lot of people who would have no um, spiritual inclinations at all might practice meditation, might practice yoga, and so on, um, and have similar experiences uh, to others, but label it differently. So this leads me to three theories, just three things to think about. This is by no means comprehensive. Um, it's just th thoughts I'm working through um, regarding myself, um, and it really plays out in my uh, real daily life. But the theories. So um, one idea is that if we just get into ourselves, uh, we can become narcissistic, get lost in that reflection of ourselves or solipsistic, living in our own little world. So some argue that the mystical experience should lead to transformation, a change, shifts, um, or even social justice um, to be expressed in life so that it has real effects. Uh, this is something to think about. Um, Another is attribution theory. So um, this is where um, the idea that we have similar experiences, but then we apply, we um, interpret it according to our preconceived ideas so that the trance state of the Christian mystic, um, that same experience will be interpreted differently by someone raised in a different context. So an example, a practical example that I sometimes look at with my classes is something called witch writing. It's still um, reported in the Southeast, um, Louisiana. Um, some of my students have said their family members or themselves have experienced um, waking in the night and they're pinned down by a spirit and they can't move. 
Now, if, uh, some people have been taught that it's a, a witch has sent a spirit, and it can be dispelled by the Lord's Prayer. But others have been taught that it's a demon or a ghost. And so the similar experience has been interpreted differently by different people. And other students who were raised in a scientific um, mindset tell me, oh, it's sleep paralysis. And r rattle off what, you know, yeah, I've had that. And uh, provide a scientific explanation. So uh, that's a theory to factor into this. Um, finally, a lot of the mystical traditions uh, both warn and teach about these experiences. And, and by this I, I refer to the altered states and the ec ecstatic uh, feelings that can accompany them. So a lot of the mystical traditions give the warning, don't become attached to the feelings, don't become attached to the experiences, but look to what they represent, what is being communicated, what transformation are they signifying. So a Pas Pascal, for example, had a mystical experience wrote it down on a piece of paper, and sewed it into the pocket of his coat. And he held, it's almost like building an altar of remembrance. And he always kept that with him, and it inspired him um, for his whole life. So it can be important what we write down and record and put into practice. Um, anyway, the warning is don't become too attached to the feelings and the experience that can come and go, or come in waves and cycles. Um, at the same time, as they warn, um, give this warning, the mystical traditions teach how to attain these um, uh, states as well, uh, how to practice the yoga, how to meditate. So there's some theories, some different types, the idea of um, how mysticism can be um, broader, more uh, communal, how it can be expanded into um, long-term practice, and how it's uh, single experiences as well. And then thrown into the mix for my own identity is the choice to be all-inclusive rather than tribal um, on the one hand, or completely universalist um, on the other. So thank you so much for uh, listening to this, and um, if you have insights or comments, please do uh, put them below. Uh, I hope you will find connection with people in your life, with online community, and on your spiritual path, whatever that might be. Take care.